Welcome to this Killick Explains Finance video. This week, can F scores, whatever they are, uncover stock market winners? Some people think they still can, so let's take a look at that. Now, the context is what exactly? So, value investors want stocks with strong fundamentals. Now, value investing has arguably been slightly out of favour the last few years, but nonetheless, value stocks are those with strong fundamentals that tend to deliver over the long term and will slide back into fashion no two ways about it at some point. But what are they and how can you evaluate them? So is there an easy way to pick out the best value stocks, if you like? Well, the Piotrowski F score is an attempt to put one number on value stocks to differentiate winners from losers. So if it works, it's got to be worth its weight in gold, let's say. One number as a screen. So here it is. Now, Joseph Piotrowski was who? Well, he was a Stanford accounting professor. In April 2000, he published an important paper with a fairly lengthy title, The Use of Historical Financial Information to Separate Winners from Losers. So you can see how that sounds quite useful, lengthy though the title might be. And basically, what he suggested was that between 1976 and 1999, it's quite a long study period, long, short F-score stocks strategies return 23% annually. That's a 7.5% premium over the broader market and fairly consistently at that. Now, if you're wondering what on earth a long, short F-score strategy might be, essentially we're going to cover that in a moment. It's buying high F-score stocks and selling or shorting low F-score stocks. Well, there we have it. Let's take a look at what the F-score actually is and then consider whether there's something in this for private investors. Now, what are F-scores? Well, they're made up of a number of components. So one number, lots of bits. So he suggested you start by screening out basically your price to book value stocks, take the bottom 20%. So you're looking for stocks that are cheap. And then what you're going to do is apply F scores to them to work out where the best value lies. Now you can apply F scores to a wider population of stocks, but that's where he suggested you want to start. And Piotrowski basically allocates using F scores naught to nine, nine being good, naught being low. So we're looking for stocks that score well on the F-score basis. There are nine ways to score a point, and if you get all nine, there's your nine-point stock, your maximum score. The higher the score, the better the stock. So a long, short strategy, as it's called, would be buying high eight to nine F-scoring stocks and dumping or shorting low F-score stocks. Now, private investors can't short stuff very easily, but Nonetheless, perhaps there's still some merit in screening for stocks that have high scores and looking to investigate those more. Now, a bit more detail. So, although it's one number, it has several components. There are three big components and there are tests that sit underneath each one, if you like. So, profitability is number one. We're going to turn that one over and take a look under it in a moment. Leverage is number two. And efficiency is number three. And a stock needs to score well across all three criteria to make, into, make it into the high F score group, if you like. So what are the tests that make up these three broad categories? Well, I cover these in detail in other videos. So I'm going to just run through them fairly quickly here. At the end, I'll give you an address for those other videos. But here we go. Profitability is set one. So the tests, if you like, and you can get basically, the way this works is you either get one point or none. And that's it. And there are nine tests. So net income is the first test. Looking at the profit and loss count. Very simple system. Positive net income in the last report, score one. Anything else, i.e. zero or negative, score zero. So the, these um, tests don't scale in the sense that even if you've got very small but positive income, you get a point, if you like, and that, some people say, is a criticism of this system. But nonetheless, there it is. Now, if that is backed, so that's the profit and loss count, if that's backed by operating cash flow, have another point. So now you're up to two, if you like. If it isn't, then score nothing. Okay, so your maximum score so far, two, minimum zero. And that's how this system works. You're trying to build towards eight or nine points as a company to get the maximum score, if you like. Now, the quality of income, so comparing these two, looking at operating cash flow versus net income, and I cover these in more detail in other videos, so I'm flying through it here a little bit. One point, if you've got operating cash flow that does cover at least net income, no points if you haven't. And finally, return on assets. Is it positive? Have another point. That could be four out of four so far. If not, score zero. 
So maximum score four on the profitability test, minimum score zero. And all Petrovsky is doing is building a picture by asking a set of relatively simple questions, but obviously they require a bit of digging around to find the answers in the accounts and PL and balance sheet and so on. The logic, long-term value stocks should be capable of delivering profitability, test one, backed by cash flow, test two and three, and generate reasonable overall level of return as a result, test four. So that's the kind of story that this is supposed to be telling you. Now, it's not all about profitability. So, set of test number two cover liquidity, leverage, and funding. If you like the financing structure of the business and the kind of business risk that sits behind it. So the tests, again, you're looking to gather some more points here. Current ratio, first of all, that's the relationship between current assets, short-term assets, and current liabilities. Greater than last year, have another point. Not, have no points, all right? Gearing, so that's looking at the relationship between debt and equity funding. Basically, the more debt you take on, Piotrowski reckons the riskier you are. Now that's not universally accepted as an argument, but it's an important part of this score. So, if gearing is lower than last year, score a point. If not, no points. Probably getting the idea by now. And then equity issuance, looking at your capital structure. Shareholders should be a, a last resort place you go for funding. It's not a good sign, according to Petrovsky, if you have to keep going cap in hand to your shareholders. So no equity issuance scores you a point there. If you've had to go to them cap in hand, begging for more money, don't have a point. All right, so some more points to score there, potentially. And the logic, which I've kind of covered already, the current ratio is all about the ability to pay back short-term liability, so that's liquidity, if you like, immediate liquidity. Gearing is the relationship between debt and equity finance. That's more about the way you are structured financially. And equity issuance, as I mentioned before, is an overall demonstration of capital strength, in the sense that if you haven't had to go there, perhaps you are the stronger company as a result. So three more points, potentially, to gather there to build up to your maximum nine. And then finally, operational efficiency. And here, Piotrowski suggests you look at gross margin, and there are plenty of observers in the market who like gross margin, Terry Smith at Fundsmith, for example. Simple test, higher than last year, scores you one point, anything else doesn't. And then finally, asset turnover. Now, I haven't written out all the formula here, if you like, that's for the eggheads in a sense, but are you able to squeeze sales out of your assets, essentially? Okay, higher than last year, you're better at it than you were a year ago, score one, no, you're not, score zero. So two more points going begging there. The logic being, this is operational effectiveness, gross margin looks at direct sales versus cost of sales. That needs to be improving, according to Piotrowski. And asset turnover, is the company squeezing more bang per buck out of its assets? That's a good thing, if it is, according to the F-score. So there you have it. You could go away with a maximum score of nine or a minimum score potentially of zero. And his theory was you want to be getting into the stocks that are scoring seven to nine, let's say, bit of debate on exactly where that range sits, and steer clear of or even short the stocks that are down the bottom, the sort of naught to one to two area. So does it still work? Now opinion does divide on this, but it is undoubtedly a useful screen insofar as it's asking core questions. How profitable, how efficient, How's it financed? So those are always important questions to ask, but various studies have been done to try and work this out. So Turtle Wang was a big one. This covered 125,000 firms between 1973 and 2014. Translation, big coverage, both in terms of the number of companies and the period looked at. And essentially they decided or concluded that every high F score portfolio outperformed low F score equivalents. So that's pretty conclusive and it's particularly strong where you've got smaller, less liquid stocks, where you've got informational inefficiencies, for example, liquidity premiums and so on. So actually, the place this really can um, show up as a, as a good way to screen stocks is in the kind of smaller cap environment, potentially. That was one of the conclusions they reached. So there it is. It's a great structure, thinking about stocks. It's a fairly fiddly test to apply to get all nine points, but nonetheless, it's a good way to think about screening for stocks that might be good value. Any questions on what is quite a big topic, um, editor at killick.com. And if you're wondering about some of those numbers I mentioned, asset turnover, gross margin, then I'd go to killick.com forward slash learn and head for the shares and financial ratios tabs.